what's up people uh this is a piece by paul hampton titled was stalinism the new barbarism published in workers liberty series one number 66 january 2001 paul hampton analyzes the arguments used by tony cliff and others to rubbish the ideas developed in the 1940s by max Schachtman and the quote unorthodox end quote trotskyists in the usa around the u.s about the ussr this is the second part of an article whose first part appeared in Workers' Liberty 62. Um, I don't know what the uh, other piece is called, but this is under a section that's, uh, yeah. I'm just going to read this piece. It's going to stand alone piece. That's how it's presented on the website. What was Stalinism? Excuse me, was Stalinism the new barbarism? Okay, so here we go. By the late 40s, Schachtman came to the conclusion that Stalinism was, quote, the new barbarism, end quote. Cliff understood that there were two meanings of the term, quote, barbarism, end quote. The first sense meant a description of the period since 1917, given the belatedness of the socialist revolution in which humanity had been subjected to the horrors of fascism, depression, and war. Schachtman described Stalinism as, quote, totalitarian or bureaucratic collectivism, a regime of modern barbarism, modern slavery, permanent police terror, and super-exploitation, end quote. Echoing Trotsky's verdict in 1939 that, quote, fascism on one hand and the, degeneration, the degeneration of the Soviet state on the other outlined the social and political forms of neo-barbarism, end quote. Um, uh, Trotsky also said uh, that Stalinism was politically worse than fascism, uh, but that was before, I, mean, I don't know if he'd still say that after Barbarossa and the Holocaust, but what the point remains. Uh, Cliff didn't dispute the, this use of the word, but directed his fire at another meaning, which made barbarism a particular stage in history. Quote, when Marx spoke of the, quote, common ruin of the contending classes, end quote, as in Rome after slave society disintegrated, it was associated with the general decline of the productive forces. The Stalinist regime, with its dynamic development of the productive forces, certainly does not fit this description. Barbarism in Marx's concept meant the death of the embryo of the future in the womb of the old society. The embryo of socialism is in the body of capitalism is social, collective, large-scale production associated with it the working class. The Stalinist regime not only did not weaken these elements but spurred them on, end quote. Tony Cliff. The quotation is further confirmation that Cliff agreed with, quote, orthodox, end quote, Trotskyism that the Stalinist bureaucracy was progressive, or at least the most progressive development of capitalism, capitalism's highest stage, because the Stalinist bureaucracy developed the productive forces. Cliff was miffed with Schachtman largely because Schachtman moved away from that view. But what did Schachtman really mean? Schachtman did not deny some development of the productive forces nor the potential of the Russian working class. Schachtman was trying to fit bureaucratic collectivism into the broad epochal scheme laid down by Marx, but remained within the parameters laid down by Trotsky in 1939. Stalinism was either part of the epoch of the transition to socialism inaugurated by the 1917 revolution, or it represented the collapse of civilization, i.e. barbarism. Sorry, that was a quote. There's a, there wasn't a quotation at the beginning. Quote, Stalinism was either part of the epoch of the transition to socialism inaugurated by the 1917 revolution, or it represented the collapse of civilization, i.e. barbarism, end quote. Perhaps Schachtman was ultimately mistaken in conceiving of Stalinism as the new barbarism, but Schachtman was at least conscious of the origin of this error, Cliff, not the error itself. Be a typo. In this perspective, quote, the first thing to grasp of in his perspective, quote, the first thing to grasp about Stalinism is that world capitalism is at the end of its rope. It shows all the classical signs of decay and disintegration in addition to those special signs which are its own distinctive contribution, end quote. Shackman. <laughs> 
Schatzman added, however, that, quote, Stalinism rose to solve a social crisis in its own way, which other existing social forces could not or would not solve in the way that is appropriate to them, end quote. It was his faulty analysis of capitalism rather than of Stalinism that was largely responsible for these errors on the place of Stalinism history. Nevertheless, Schachtman exhibited great insight into how to formulate the answer. Quote, Trotsky himself once derided his, quote, pseudo-Marxism, end quote, the point of view which confines itself to historical mechanisms, formal analogies, converting historical epochs into logic, a logical succession of inflexible social categories, feudalism, capitalism, socialism, autocracy, bourgeois republic, dictatorship of the proletariat. Marxists, especially those educated by Lenin and Trotsky, will readily admit that classes and nations can leap forward in history, can leap over stages, can be hurled backwards along the main line of historical development. But in speaking of Stalinist Russia, they will obdurately refuse to acknowledge that history, quote, permits, end quote, side leaps, mongrel social formations, unique contributions, leap forward, yes, thrust backward, yes, leap sideways, no, that is, the, that is strictly prohibited by the party statutes, end quote. Schachtman. It might be reasonable to argue that the Workers' Party Independent Socialist League tradition was not in, in especially coherent or lucid about the place of Stalinism in history, although neither were other theorists, including Cliff. Schachtman alluded briefly to Marx's comments on the so-called Asiatic mode of production, in which a state bureaucracy exploited the mass of peasants by extracting a tribute. Such a system, far from being a historical aberration, actually turns out to be the main line of development before capitalism, and is essential in any Marxist explanation of ancient Egypt, India, and China, as well as the pre-Hispanic Mayan, Inca, Aztec empires. A more fruitful parallel than barbarism would have been these oriental de despotisms or tributary societies in which the state played the role of surplus extraction formed the locus of the ruling and formed the locus of the ruling class. Stalinism represented a comparable phenomenon alongside capitalism in the modern world. In countries where an indigenous capitalist class was either weak or pretty well non-existent. The substance of Cliff's criticism is also sheer nonsense. Contrasting Schachtman's inconsistencies with, quote, Marx and Engels's analysis of capitalism, bracket where, and bracket the fundamentals, the place of capitalism in history, capitalism's internal contradictions, etc., remained constant from their earliest tackling of the problem until the end of their lives, end quote. Schachtman. I mean, sorry, not Schachtman, Cliff. They were studying a social trans, uh, studying a social formation that existed for had existed for centuries, and a society about which bourgeois writers had already produced mountains of material, both theoretical and empirical, in which they could build. For Trotsky and Trotsky's followers, the situation was completely different. The phenomenon had only just evolved, and studies of its nature and development were still extremely limited. Nor is it true that Marx and Engels' conception of capitalism was born fully formed. Witness the developed understanding of surplus value and the distinction between labor and labor power. Cliff preferred the safety of familiar words and the illusion of ideological rectitude to search for the real contradictions and movement of Stalinism. New section. What is the historical function of the Stalinist bureaucracy? Cliff had given the bureaucracy the function of a historical surrogate for a normal bourgeois class suggesting a view of its stability and longevity not shared by other theories. Schachtman had characterized the bureaucracy as a class without a past or future. It had arisen at a particular conjuncture after capitalism had been overthrown in 1917, but the failure of other socialist revolutions had left the USSR isolated. Schachtman borrowed this limited rationale from Trotsky, who had written, quote, the historical justification for the very existence of the bureaucracy is lodged in the fact that we are very far removed from socialist society, end quote. As a class without a future, Schachtman wanted to distinguish it from other ruling classes in history of greater power and durability. The bureaucracy could not solve the social crisis any more than capitalism could. Only the working class had this capacity. The historical development and limits of Stalinism were defined by the belatedness of the international socialist revolution.
Schachtman, having sloughed off Trotsky's name tag in 1940, continued to apply the theory which Trotsky had developed in the late 30s. Joseph Carter and Hal Draper were more innovative, utilizing Christian Rakovsky's insights and Trotsky's more po critical political economy from the early 30s. Carter had understood the inherent limits inherent limits of the system from the beginning, writing in 1937 that, quote, the progressive role, end quote, of the bureaucracy was exhausted and that, quote, economic disorder, dislocation, and crises are now the rule rather than the exception, end quote. Draper later developed the theory of bureaucratic collectivism, defining the driving force of the system as, quote, the contradiction between, one, the absolute need of the economy to be planned since in a statified economy, only the plan can perform the role in society which under capitalism is the function of the market and market relations. Two, the impossibility of workably planning a modern complex society from the top down under conditions of bureaucratic totalitarianism, end quote. Hal Draper. This gave Stalinism a very definite lifespan, both in terms of its economic potential and its liability to social change. Excuse me, to social challenge. Um, it looks like the next thing is a block quote, but I'm not sure because it's not really formatted right. I'm reading this from a web page. So I'm assuming this is a quote, and I'm going to assume it's from Hal Draper. Um, this is probably transcribed from a magazine, and uh, probably hastily. <laughs> Um, maybe I'm wrong. Uh, maybe, I'm, maybe it isn't a quote. I don't know. I'm just going to read it. To denominate Stalinism as a social system does not confer on Stalinism any determinate lease of life, nor any historical era of existence. History does not give social systems any uniform term. Early tribalism must have lasted for unknown millennia, slavery for perhaps for perhaps hundreds of centuries, the feudalism of the Middle Ages for over a thousand years. If anything, the term seemed to be shrinking logarithmically. Unlike any previous system, bureaucratic collectivism had hardly appeared on the scene before it was shaken by economic and political convulsions. The revolution against Stalinism did not have to remain a vision for a couple hundred of, year, couple of hundred years, as was true in the revolution against capitalism. It appeared in life in little more than a couple of decades, in Budapest, in East Germany, in Poland at least. Okay, so, um, I'm going to assume that's how Draper. Quote, state capitalism, end quote, seemed to bring a veneer of Marxological sophistication to the discussion, but in fact, State capitalism was a substitute for thinking, especially as Cliff failed to prove that the bureaucracy was a capitalist class, only asserting that it must be an agent of capitalism. A capital, like analysis, like the book capital, like analysis was unnecessary given the structure of the USSR. Its laws of motion were not disguised and hidden as under capitalism because political and economic power were fused together. The request for complex economic laws of motion in societies other than capitalism is a red herring. That's actually a fucking fascinating couple of lines. I, I really would need to chew on that one. Um, a capital, like Marx's capital, like analysis was unnecessary given the structure of the USSR. The USSR's laws of motion were not disguised and hidden as under ha capitalism because political and economic power were fused together. The request for complex economic laws of motion in societies other than capitalism is a red herring. One could argue about the extent to which they developed this theory or about its validity, but it is only possible to dismiss the work Workers' Party Independent Socialist League tradition by ignoring the large quantity of the literature the Workers' Party Independent Socialist League produced for 18 years. New section. What is the motive of exploitation in bureaucratic collectivist society? Having tried to establish their disorientation on the place of Stalinism in history, Cliff attacks Schachtman on the motive for exploitation in bureaucratic collectivism. Um, 
I don't know why I didn't say this earlier, but I have a critique by Tony Cliff of bureaucratic collectivist theory um, on this channel. Um, in his revised version, Cliff quoted Schachtman's comment that, quote, in the Stalinist state, production is carried on and extended for the satisfaction of the needs of the bureaucracy, for increasing the bureaucracy's wealth, the bureaucracy's privileges, the bureaucracy's power, end quote, forgetting again that this expression came from Trotsky. Cliff then sallied forth with the silly point made nowhere by Schachtman or his co-thinkers that, quote, if the bureaucratic collectivist society is gearing to the, quote, needs of the bureaucracy, end quote, excuse me, is geared to the, quote, needs of the bureaucracy, end quote, is not subordinated to capital accumulation, there is no reason why the rate of exploitation should not decrease in time, and as the productive forces in the modern world are dynamic, this will lead willy-nilly to the, quote, withering away of exploitation, end quote, end quote. Tony Cliff. No one in the Workers' Party Independent Socialist League tradition ever argued that exploitation would wither away under Stalinism. Quite the opposite. They pointed to exploitation's viciousness in the USSR. If taken seriously, Cliff's view would preclude Marxists from explaining any society other than capitalism, except by reference to Marx's flippant comments about the size of the ruling class's stomachs. Hardly adequate to explain the ancient civilizations, it is also a methodological volta face. In reality, ga In reality, Gond and Marxist theory, I don't know, that's a typo, I think. The mode of exploitation or the mode of surplus extraction is the determinant of classes. The motives of the ruling class are simply not the principal issue. New section. What are the class relations under bureaucratic collectivism? Cliff made another methodological twist when he argued that the character of the class struggle in any epoch is, quote, dependent on the nature of the oppressed class itself, the position it has in the process of production, the relation between its members in this process, and the relation to the owners of the means of production. These are not determined by the mode of appropriation or mode of recruitment of the ruling class." End quote, Tony Cliff. Two, Cliff cited the Spartan ruling class, the medieval clergy, and the Mameluk period of, quote, Arab feudalism, end quote, as examples of ruling classes which collectively exploited the peasantry. Cliff's point was that, quote, the big difference between the mode of appropriation and the recruitment of the Russian bureaucracy and that of the bourgeoisie in itself does not at all prove that Russian rep Russia represents a non-capitalist society, a new class society of bureaucratic collectivism. To prove this, it is necessary to show the that the nature of the toiling class, its conditions of living and struggle is fundamentally different in Russia from dot 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 capitalism, end quote. Cliff. Here, Cliff is asserting that if the Russian workers are proletarians in the Marxist sense, then the mode of production can only be capitalism. However, the analogy doesn't make sense in this context. For one thing, the contrast between a society like Sparta, in which a ruling class collectively exploits the slave class, with a society like Athens, in which a ruling class of landowners privately exploit their slaves, sounds like a better analogy for the relationship between capitalism and bureaucratic collectivism. During the Middle Ages, matters were different. The clergy were, in fact, a subsection of a ruling class whose main private landowners could inherit the family's property, i.e. land. The collective exploitation of peasantry on church land was only a supplement to, rather, a dominant, rather than a dominant feature of that epoch. Also, it is not clear that parts of the Middle East during the Mameluke period... Uh, 250 to 1517, where again a ruling class based on the state collectively exploiting the peasantry can be called, quote, Arab feudalism, end quote. Cliff introduced examples which served only to muddle the issue and rested his case on the false assumption that if the basic exploiting class was a peasantry, then it must be feudalism. In reality, peasants were exploited in different ways in pre-capitalist societies, by paying rent, by paying a tribute in tax or in kind, and also by compulsory military service. What these matters were of principal 
That these matters were of principal concern for peasants is witnessed by the extent of peasant revolts throughout the world, some facilitating the downfall of rulers and of whole civilizations. Cliff's point, that it makes no difference to the direct producers how the ruling class appropriate their product, is simply wrong. He is concerned with establishing by analogy that the Russian workers can only be exploited by a state capitalist ruling class than engaging with Schachtman's real views. New section. What is the nature of the working class in Russia? If Cliff failed to make an impression on historical matters, then Cliff certainly fell on fell on stronger ground. To me, felt on stronger ground when he raised the question of the nature of Russian work, the Russian workers. Cliff had seen in the New International the term quote slave labor end quote used loosely for the Russian working class. Trotsky, too, had called them, quote, semi-slaves, end quote. Schachtman, said Cliff, had tried to avoid the, conclu the conclusion that the Russian workers were not real proletarians, but denied that a labor market existed in the USSR and claimed that, the, that slave labor was the, quote, basic factor of production, end quote. Cliff recoiled in mock horror, quote, dot, 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 if Schachtman is right and there is no proletariat in the Stalinist regime, Marxism as a method, as a guide for the proletariat, as the subject of historical change, becomes superfluous, meaningless. To speak of Marxism in a society without a proletariat is to make of Marxism a supra-historical theory, end quote. Instead, Cliff argued that a labor market exist, did exist in the USSR under Stalin, citing as proof that, quote, the Russian worker, notwithstanding all restrictions, moves from one factory to another much more than the German worker, or for that matter, than any other worker in the whole world, end quote. End quote. All the factories producing tanks and aeroplanes, machinery, etc., were run on wage labor, end quote. Cliff. This is another blatant falsification. Far from denying the socialist potential of the working class in Russia, the Workers' Party Independent Socialist League went on arguing for it even after their American perspectives began to wither. For example, Max Martin wrote in 1957, quote, dot, 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 if the Hungarian Revolution has struck shattering blows at the myth of totalitarian invincibility and confirmed the Marxist analysis of Stalinism as a class society in general, it has also demonstrated once again the socialist view of the key role of the working class in the struggle against all oppression and as the bearer of the socialist emancipation of society." End quote. Schachtman also gave a devastating answer to Cliff's spurious assertion. Quote, the modern Stalinist bureaucracy has to as its credit has to its credit the development of an industrial basis for the socialist reorganization of Russian society. Dot, dot, dot. This development has been grossly overrated, for Russia is even today far behind the advanced countries of capitalism. The development is nonetheless unmistakable. Its real achievement from the class point of view, however, is the shaping and maintaining of its own gravedigger, dot, dot, dot. This gravedigger is the new Russian working class, which was to total in the figures projected for the end of the third five-year plan, 1942, some 32 million wage and salary earners with one-third or more in industry proper and not counting at least 10 million toilers in the slave camps. Even if these figures require some modification, it cannot make a serious difference. The change between 1913 and today, between 1917 and today, certainly between 1921 and today, and even between 1928 and today, is, in this respect at least, of tremendous importance. What is more, the period of Stalinist rule has seen the formation of what we call the new type of working class, old and familiar to the main capitalist countries, but not to Russia. Schwartz provides all the necessary data on this score, dot, dot, dot. Today, the process of developing a modern working class without rural ties is all but completed in the Soviet Union, end quote. Cliff. Cliff was also wrong about a labor market in Russia. Cliff confused the movement of labor with a market for the buying and selling of labor power. But there was no market. 
If as Cliff himself recognized, there were no capitalists to compete for workers, nor any reserve army of labor which Marx saw as fundamental to the operation of a labor market, nor indeed a monetary system which allowed the comparison of the, quote, commodities, end quote, produced, including, of course, the labor power. When Russian workers might spend nearly as long queuing for bread as they spend at work in Eat, earning the rubles to pay for it. This is indeed a very odd market system. Schachtman recognized that Russia had a modern industrial working class, divorced from ownership and control of the means of production and therefore forced to work. But the form of exploitation was not the same as wage labor. The surplus was extracted by the state and, state, and the state rationed, quote, planned, end quote, its use, including distributing the means of consumption. Within this system, slave labor played an actual or potential role in coercing the proletariat to work. From this class structure, the workers derived their interest and their power to overturn the system and replace it with socialism, but what they lacked was the space to develop self-conscious politics and, to organ and the organization to do so. The end. It says part three of this article will deal with Cliff's arguments on the nature of the communist parties. Um, I'm going to read the note. The, uh, the article is over, so you can click out if you want. Um, but I'm just going to read the notes, and the pieces in them. Um, notes. Uh, Trotsky, again and once more again on the nature of the USSR in defense of Marx. From, that's from In Defense of Marxism. That'll be on the channel. I have that recorded. Schachtman, The Nature of the Russian State. Um, I don't believe I have that on here. Maybe I didn't. Uh, no, I don't have it on here. Uh, because it's later reprinted as, quote, Stalinism and the Marxist tradition. But I will read it eventually because it's in Matt Gomna's The Fate of the Russian Revolution. Note 2. Schachtman, The Russian Stalinist Social System. Labor Action, 10th of May, 1954, and Schachtman, 25 Years of the Russian Revolution, New International, de November 1942. The reference to Trotsky is found in Appendix, I don't know, 1 of the History of the Russian Revolution, Volume 1. Note 3. Draper took up these issues in the first volume of his Karl Marx's Theory of Revolution of 1977, for more recent contributions on this question, see Chris Wickham in The Other Transition from Past and Present, which is a, journal, a historical journal from the UK um, with a Marxist heritage. Um, it's like a, I believe that's where like the Brenner deb debate took place. Um, and his piece, uh, Chris Wickham's The Uniqueness of the East. Um, if you don't know who Chris Wickham is, Chris Wickham is like... Uh, one of the uh, uh, biggest Marxist historians of like peasant studies and like the medieval period and stuff. I think he writes about maybe like um, Renaissance era Mediterranean, like Italy and shit like that too. That's what I know him for. But he's like a um, like a big Russian like social, uh, not social historian, but like I guess like a. I don't know what you want to call him, but he writes about, uh, uh, he's a, a Marxist historian of like the Middle Ages. I think he wrote a big book on the Middle Ages, actually. I think that's what it's like. I think he wrote a book called like The Middle Ages, which I think is like, not just like a, uh, is like, um, is widely respected beyond the narrow confines of um, like the Marxist world. Like I think he's a very, like a, a scholar that's taken very seriously within his, um, discipline. Anyway, uh, note four, Trotsky, the Kirov assassination, December 8th, 1934, writings of Leon Trotsky, Carter, the class nature of the Stalinist state, Draper, Stalinist imperialism and the Cold War crisis, reprinted in Draper, Introduction to Independent Socialism, 1963, Draper wrote this in 1967. It was reprinted in a pamphlet, The Dynamics of Bureaucratic Collectivism. See Martin, The Working Class versus the Totalitarian Myth in Labor Action, 13th of May, 1957. Schachtman, a value, uh, 
a valuable aid for understanding Russia, review of labor in the Soviet Union by Solomon Schwartz, New International, um, April, March, April, 1953. Um, just as a side note, that book by, uh, I'm ready? yeah, I'll be, I'm, I'm actually, I don't know, maybe, probably, um, yeah, a review of labor in the Soviet Union by Solomon Schwartz, New International, 1953. I think that this uh, book, the Solomon Schwartz book, uh, Labor in uh, so the Soviet Union, I think, even though it's really pretty old, you know, like 1953, I think it's still pr taken pretty seriously as like a starting point for under like in al analyzing labor history in the Soviet Union. Like, I'm pretty sure if you listen to the art things that I have on here from. Fuck, why is his name blanking on me? Donald Filzer. If you look at, the, like, especially the ones that he has that I've read from, that are from, like, uh, like the handbooks of the history of communism, his piece, uh, in his, like, further reading section of that, like the bibliographical essay that's at the bottom of that uh, uh, chapter, uh, he recommends uh, this book as, like, a good starting point. Um, so that just kind of speaks to it's like uh, I should read it myself, and it seems like if it's getting uh, valuable praise from Max Schachtman and valuable praise from Donald Filzer, uh, two people whose uh, knowledge on this subject is uh, vast and deep, um, it should be worth reading on my own. Maybe I'll read it eventually on here. But thanks for listening.